on World News Tonight. Climate concerns, efforts increase in tackling the alarming rise of global pollution. Jabs for all, youngsters to receive new vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. Cool chaos, Sudan citizens resist an all-out military takeover. Broadway is back. The Phantom of the Opera dazzles audiences yet again after pandemic shutdowns. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with more updates on the rising calamities in America. A massive drop in air pressure combined with an influx of tropical moisture caused a deluge of rain and high wind on the west coast. Forecasters are calling it the strongest storm to ever hit the region. Tonight, the west blasted by the destructive power of a bomb cyclone. A swift and massive drop in air pressure combined with an influx of extra tropical moisture causing a deluge of rain and high wind. Eight million under flood and wind alerts, tens of thousands still without power. Forecasters calling it the single strongest storm to ever hit the west coast. Individuals are stuck in uh, a large amount of water here. Just outside Seattle, tragedy. Two people killed by a fallen tree. In Northern California, historic rainfall. Residents racing to keep water out of their home. Yeah, the, the storm pounding the region, a result of climate change driving extreme weather more frequently with the globe's warming climate. A week ago, we were, we were saying the drought, we've got no water, and here we are a week later going, too much water. The storm upending trucks, toppling trees into homes, and forcing evacuations, burn scars, now pathways for dangerous debris. Meanwhile, tornadoes flattening homes across Illinois and Missouri as another powerful storm system turns across the country. Can't open rip the lid off the house. <laughs> 35 million now under flood alerts across the Northeast. Residents bracing for heavy rain and high winds. While the recovery out west is just getting started. The World Meteorological Organization reported via the United Nations that greenhouse gas concentrations hit a new record high last year and increased at a faster rate than the annual average for the last uh, decade despite a temporary reduction during pandemic-related lockdowns. The UN Weather Agency said on Monday that greenhouse gas concentrations hit a new record in 2020. It warns that the world was way off track for capping rising temperature. A World Meteorological Organization report showed that carbon dioxide levels in 2020 has risen more than the average rate over the last decade. Secretary General Pateri Tales said this could result in a 2.5 to 3 degrees Celsius temperature rise. That's around 37 degrees Fahrenheit, rather than 1.2 to 2 degree, a target that was made in the 2015 Paris Agreement. Carbon dioxide can remain in the atmosphere for centuries. So even though emission rate dipped during lockdowns in 2020, the report confirmed it did not have any discernible impact on the atmospheric levels of greenhouse gases and the growth rates. The report also flagged concerns about the ability of the ocean and land to absorb roughly half of CO2 emissions. These so-called carbon sinks should act as a natural buffer for dramatic temperature increases. But the data collected by WMO over 10 years show that some of these carbon sinks have turned to carbon source for the first time, including the Amazon rainforest. Talis urged leaders who are heading to the COP26 conference to make a, quote, dramatic increase in commitments in tackling global warming. Cutting carbon emissions isn't the only thing needed to prevent global warming. There are other greenhouse gases that must be reduced, such as methane. That's why South Korea is joining the Global Methane Pledge dedicated to cutting emissions. South Korea is joining the global commitment to cut methane emissions by signing up to the Global Methane Pledge. According to the Trade Ministry on Monday, the U.S. and EU-led initiative aims to cut global methane emissions by at least 30 percent in the coming decade, and South Korea plans to cut its emissions by the same amount. 
Methane is one of the six greenhouse gases designated by the Kyoto Protocol and is responsible for around a third of all global warming. It also accounts for around half of the one degree Celsius net rise in the global average temperature since the pre-industrial era. In 2018, South Korea emitted some 28 million tons of methane, mainly in the agriculture, waste and energy sectors. By 2030, the country aims to cut that down to 19.7 million tons. The agriculture sector accounts for 43 percent of South Korea's total emissions, and that largely comes from rice cropping and livestock excretions. The government plans to improve water in rice paddies and better treat animal waste. The waste sector, which takes up one-third of emissions, will focus on reducing food waste as well as reinforcing landfill facilities. The last 22 percent, coming from energy sector, will be reduced through improving energy efficiency and expanding the use of green energy. The government says the pledge complements its plans to make the country carbon neutral by 2050. Meanwhile, in France, pollution is being taken action against as citizens locate illegal landfills close to Paris in what was claimed to be protected forest areas. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. For more, Chetana. Shanali, near a forest barely 20 kilometers from Paris, an impromptu landfill covering more than 60 hectares is just one of many illegal waste dumps polluting the French countryside. The industrial waste is dumped by polluters evading garbage disposal fees. Volunteers at local citizens' collective are visibly disturbed as they walk across the illegal dumps filled with plastic tubs, asbestos sheets and metal waste. Legal waste disposal in France can cost up to 115 euros per ton for industrial refuse while illegal dumping can cost as little as 4 euros per ton. It's lucrative business for illegal operators, one that is causing anonymous environmental damage since the fermentation of the trash produces methane, a dangerous greenhouse gas. Trash is polluting up in France, hidden in plain sight across the suburbs and the countryside. Starting this year, the government is taking action against the dozens of illegal dumps polluting East Territory. Back to Shanali. All right, thank you. And that was Adha Dharanawalya Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. We have some good news for you. A group of recyclers in the Philippines are trying to tackle the country's soaring plastic waste crisis by turning bottles, single-use sachets and snack food wrappers that clog rivers and spoil beaches into building materials. The plastic flamingo, or the pluff, as they are commonly known, collect the waste, shred it and then mold it into posts and planks called ecolamba that can be used for fencing, decking or even take disaster relief shelters. Erika Reyes, the PLAF's chief operating officer, said it is 100% upcycled material, 100% made from plastic waste materials, includes some additives and colorants, and it is rot-free, maintenance-free and also splinter-free. Having collected over 100 tons of plastic waste since it started in 2019, the company is doing its bit to try to tackle a local problem that has global ramifications. Approximately 80% of global ocean plastic comes from Asian rivers and the Philippines alone contribute a third of that total, according to a 2021 report by Oxford University's Our World in Data. But they face an uphill battle. Some 300 million tons of plastic waste are produced annually, according to the United Nations Environment Programme, a problem that has been exacerbated by the pandemic which sparked a rush for plastic face shields, gloves, takeaway food containers and bubble wrap as online shopping surged. As well as tackling waste problems, the group say that they are in talks with other non-government organizations to help rebuild houses destroyed by typhoons using their sustainable building materials. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. The FDA advisory board will meet to discuss emergency approval for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. This comes as Moderna just announced its vaccine for children triggers a robust in immune response with mostly mild to moderate side effects.
The pediatric doses of Pfizer's vaccine are ready to go for ages 5 to 11. On Tuesday, the FDA advisory board will meet to discuss EUA approval. Officials in some states already getting ahead of an expected authorization. In just a few days' time, millions of parents all across the United States should be able to breathe a sigh of relief. Pfizer says its two-dose pediatric shot, which is one-third the adult dosage, is more than 90 percent effective. While Moderna just announced its COVID vaccine for children triggers a robust immune response with mostly mild to moderate side effects. Nearly 30 million children could become eligible. But being eligible and being vaccinated are two different things. Only 30 percent of parents say they would get their children vaccinated right away. This mom of four in Kentucky is not one of them. It's so mild in kids. Like, why? Why even risk it on them? University of Indiana sociologist Jessica Colarco looked into the underlying factors with a group of 80 moms from different backgrounds. And the message of social responsibility is not resonating. The European Union's drug regulator said it has concluded in its review that Moderna's COVID-19 booster vaccine may be given to people aged 18 years and above, at least six months after the second dose. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani? Yes, Shanani. It is the second COVID-19 booster vaccine to be approved in the EU. Earlier this month, the EMA approved Pfizer-BioNTech's booster and recommended a third dose of the shot from either Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna for people with weakened immune systems. It left EU member states to decide if the wider population should receive a booster. EMA said that the implementation of vaccination campaigns remain the prerogative of the advisory groups guiding the vaccination campaigns in the EU member state. Under pressure to revive their economies, fight the more infections, infectious data variant of the coronavirus and avoid further lockdowns in the winter, several EU member states launched their own booster campaigns before EMA guidelines. The different states have taken widely varying views on who is eligible. The EMA said the risk of inflammatory heart conditions or other very rare side effects after a booster is being monitored. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adha Dharana World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Newly revealed documents show that Facebook has been studying the social harms that plague its platform for years. Researchers warn that the company's core mechanisms allow potentially dangerous and harmful content to flourish. Zuckerberg slammed the coordinated effort to selectively use leaked documents to paint a false picture to the company. For years, Facebook has been studying practically every social ill that plagues its platforms, from misinformation to threats of violence. And newly revealed documents show the company appears to be at war with itself as to what should be done about it. In a post called What is Collateral Damage on an internal message board, an employee says when it comes to misinformation, Facebook's core mechanics allow potentially dangerous and harmful content to flourish. Divisive posts and comments, researchers warned, seem to be better for business. Researchers also created fictitious accounts to examine where Facebook's rules and recommendations sent them. One set up to follow conservative news got conspiracy recommendations after only two days. Until whistleblower Francis Haugen turned these documents over to the SEC and Congress, much of this research was unknown. Internal research suggests less than 5 percent is removed. Facebook says that's because of different metrics. And the SEC can go after not just the company, but individuals. The SEC has not said if it will investigate the eight complaints it received connected to Francis Haugen. International rights group Amnesty International said it would close its Hong Kong offices because a China-imposed security law has now made it effectively impossible for rights groups to work freely without the risk of reprisals. Rights group Amnesty International will shut its offices in Hong Kong by the end of this year. That decision was driven by Hong Kong's national security law. In a statement on Monday, the group said that China-imposed law has, quote, made it effectively impossible for human rights organizations in Hong Kong to work freely and without fear of serious reprisals from the government. In the past, Hong Kong had served as one of Asia's leading NGO hubs, with groups drawn to its robust rule of law and autonomy that was promised for Hong Kong 
after the control of the former British colony was returned to Beijing in 1997. But since the implementation of the security law last year, authorities have crushed a once vibrant civil society and curbed free speech and protests. At least 35 prominent groups have disbanded, including several leading trade unions, NGOs and professional groups. While some groups have relocated to Taiwan, others are urgently shredding files and deleting photos and online material, fearing even one's innocuous details could be used against them under Hong Kong's evolving security regime. Hong Kong and Chinese authorities say the national security law enshrines individual rights, justifying the laws as necessary to restore stability after mass protest in 2019 when millions took to the streets over many months. Sudan's military seized power from a transitional government and a health ministry official said several people were killed by gunfire and 140 injured in clashes between soldiers and street protesters. Tens of thousands of protesters took to the streets of Sudan's capital Khartoum on Monday after soldiers arrested most of the members of Sudan's cabinet and detained the prime minister in an apparent military coup. Injuries and gunfire have been reported. Footage from local broadcasters shows protesters carrying the national flag near the military headquarters with plumes of black smoke and fire. Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, a general who headed the Sovereign Council, a power-sharing ruling body, announced a state of emergency across the country and dissolved the council and the transitional government. Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok was detained and moved to an undisclosed location after refusing to issue a statement in support of the coup, according to the Information Ministry, which was still apparently under the control of Hamdok supporters. The ministry called for resistance against the coup, and civilians like this man, who did not provide his name, followed suit. An urgent call to all Sudanese civilians who want to protect their revolution. What the military is doing is a betrayal to all civilians on all fronts. It is the duty of all civilians to move and to block all the roads outside to prevent any military force to move. Right now, all of us must unite to show the truth. It's to be or not to be, and we will. Sudan has been on edge since a failed coup plot just last month. Military and civilian groups have been sharing power following the toppling of the long-serving leader Omar al-Bashir two years ago. The military was meant to pass leadership of the Joint Sovereign Council to a civilian figure in the coming months. But transitional authorities had struggled to move forward on several issues, including whether to hand over Bashir to the International Criminal Court, where he is wanted on war crimes. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Japan's Princess Mako has married her college sweetheart and left the royal family after a year-long engagement bested by intense media scrutiny. After receiving the single largest purchase for its electric vehicles, automaker Tesla's market value broke the one trillion US dollar mark. Rental car company Hertz is moving forward with its ambitious plan to adopt electric vehicles as a part of their rental car fleet. South Korea will provide a million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine to Iran. The donation comes after phone talks between the foreign ministers of Seoul and Tehran last month. South Korea vowed to help Iran overcome vaccine shortage. Facebook and YouTube have taken down a video of Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, one in which he falsely claimed COVID-19 vaccines were linked to developing AIDS. Qatar's ruling emir warned the Gulf state against excessive tribalism, he said endangered national unity, proposing a plan to promote equal citizenship through changes to legislation that has inflamed tribal sensitivities. And finally tonight, a glorious return to the world of showbiz dazzled spectators as the much-awaited phantom of the opera took onto the stage after pandemic shutdowns.
New York's Broadway theaters, the lifeblood of the city's tourism industry, are finally filling up again with music, dance, and cheers. To show the world that Broadway is back. For The Phantom of the Opera, which first opened at the Majestic Theater in 1988, making it Broadway's longest-running show, it has been an especially emotional return, the show having abruptly closed on March 12th of 2020 as some cast and crew members fell sick. This is my dressing room. <laughs> Lead actress Megan Pacerno spent 2020 living in North Carolina with her parents and claiming unemployment benefits. Now, after weeks of rehearsal, with plenty of health protocols in place, she is finally back on stage. Let's go, man! <laughs> Opening night last week drew none other than the show's famed musical composer, Andrew Lloyd Webber, who even DJed at the after party. Weber told he managed to find a silver lining in the show's more than 18-month break. The reset also means vaccinations, weekly testing, and daily health questionnaires for all involved in the production, not to mention a lot more laundry for the many lavish costumes, says production tailor Annette Lovis. Just a few blocks away, the Disney musical Aladdin was forced to close for two weeks soon after its September reopening due to some actors testing positive, leaving all who work on the Great White Way acutely aware of the stakes and just how special this moment is. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.